Although a conventional petrol engine uses a spark from a spark plug to ignite the fuel, as you can see here, igniting gasoline with a spark is not that simple. It's actually almost impossible to do so with a conventional spark plug. So the engine and carburetor have to do some serious processing of this fuel in order for it to combust. And if you want to know how it happens, then keep watching. We've got a nice clean fire resistant glass. And now I'm pouring some fresh gasoline fuel in here. And with all safety fire precautions met, I will then add a flame just to show a little proof that it is gasoline I'm using and its flammability within this glass. And one thing to note while we're here watching this flame is that it's not the liquid at the bottom actually on fire. The fire itself is actually above the liquid. And this is because the combustible part of gasoline are the vapours which are tiny particles of the fuel itself evaporating upwards. And so moving upwards out of the liquid means that these particles can now mix with the oxygen in the air. And it's this mix of gasoline vapour and oxygen that can result in combustion. And it's evident where the heat and flames were just by looking at the colour of the glass. They weren't at the bottom near the liquid, they were above. Now there are many other additives within gasoline that's put there to allow the gasoline to function the way it does. But with those chemicals aside, if we were to look at gasoline in its simplest form on its own, we'd see that each molecule of it has carbon atoms within it that are linked together very much like this by special bonds. Also bonded to each of the carbon atoms are hydrogen atoms. And so they surround the carbon atoms very much like this. But unlike a molecule of diesel fuel, which is shaped in more like a chain like this, the molecule of gasoline is more compact like this. It still consists of carbon and hydrogen, but it forms this slightly different structure. And because the molecule has got eight carbon atoms, it's denoted C8, and because it's got 18 hydrogen atoms, that's denoted as H18. And together, C8H18 is the chemical formula of gasoline fuel. And you'll find a link down below in the description of a reference to this. But liquid gasoline in the fuel tank doesn't exist as just one molecule, of course. There's literally billions and billions of them all together, making up the liquid itself. So let's have a look now why what these molecules are made of, as well as all being grouped together forming this liquid. Why it is that it's actually not so combustible inside the internal combustion engine. To explain this in basic terms, we'll need an engine. So we've got the engine cylinder, the cylinder head, the spark plug and the top of the piston at the bottom. And let's imagine that somehow gasoline in liquid form has got into the engine and it's lying here on top of the piston. And naturally, of course, we've got air above here that came in on the last induction stroke. And now the piston's rising on the compression stroke. And even though we've got a concentrated amount of gasoline molecules here, and that the air above has been compressed and generated heat as it should do, both of those things, even in the presence of this spark from the spark plug, doesn't result in efficient combustion. And that's because the basic components of this liquid fuel are way too concentrated. And I can demonstrate that. Here I've got a spark plug inside this fireproof glass that I've rigged up to be able to fire. And as you can see there, there is a spark. At the moment there's just air inside the glass with it, but I'm showing that it's all dry and it's sparking. And now I'm pouring in some neat fresh gasoline and submerging the spark plug. And now, no matter how much I tried, I could not get it to spark. So the fact of the matter is, there was no spark, and certainly no combustion. So I bring the spark plug out of the fuel, and dry it, and now we've got a spark back. After that experiment, I wanted to see just how stable this liquid gasoline fuel was. So I got this Bunsen burner and heated up this rod. And again, I'm showing this in slow motion, but I then put the hot end of this rod into the gasoline itself through the vapours and into the fluid and the fluid even quenched and cooled it cooled it right down but there was no explosion there was no combustion and just in case you're wondering if this really is gasoline fuel then in comes the flame
Okay, so that's showing that the liquid gasoline is quenching the spark, preventing the spark from occurring. And so the reason these molecules won't combust is because they're missing a vital component that needs to be integrated between them. It needs to be added in, not to form part of the molecules, but to exist in there, separating the molecules. And that vital component is the oxygen from the air. And it's this mix that can result in combustion. So now I'm going to take away the oxygen by blocking off the air with this steel dish and the flames go out. So if it wasn't for the fact that gasoline needs oxygen so much, the flames would still exist inside the jar even with this lid on top blocking the air. If oxygen's all we need now in order to make this fuel combust, then why doesn't the oxygen that came in on the last induction stroke, why doesn't the presence of that result in efficient combustion? Well, simply put, the fuel also has to have oxygen-giving air mixed in it as well. But those vapours that are rising from the gasoline, they are now mixed with oxygen. They are now combustible. Surely we only need a spark to get this to combust. So I've got my dry spark plug and I'm hovering it just over the gasoline, inside that space where all those evaporated particles are rising into. And now I'll induce the spark, and as you can see there is a spark there, but there's no combustion taking place. So we'll bring it down lower, right next to the surface to see what happens there. But the same again. Even though we have evaporated fuel with oxygen, this spark isn't hot enough to ignite it. Let's have a look then at what makes good combustion. By looking very closely at a molecule of gasoline, we'll see how it goes through the combustion process. So in a good situation, this molecule of gasoline will exist there inside the engine with plenty of oxygen-rich air all around it. Of course, in the real situation, there'd be more than one molecule of fuel, and here, there'd be billions. And of course, they'd be too tiny to see with the naked eye. I'm just emphasising that the molecules of fuel need a good, rich supply of oxygen all around them. As the piston rises on the compression stroke, compressing the gasoline and the oxygen-rich air, there of course builds up a certain amount of pressure and heat as a result of that compression. So far the gasoline has been able to withstand the heat generated by the compression alone. But as the spark plug fires, that increases the heat in the molecule or the molecules closest to the spark. And that pushes the heat over and above what the gasoline molecule can withstand. And now those special bonds that were holding the hydrogen and carbon atoms together, forming the gasoline molecule, break due to the increased heat. And the breaking of these bonds themselves releases a large amount of heat energy. And this heat goes on to affect the gasoline molecules closest to it. It breaks their bonds and they produce heat. And this happens to the molecules closest to that. And this continues as what we would see as a wave of flame inside the cylinder. Engulfing the whole of the inside space and forcing the piston down as the heat causes expansion of the gases. And left behind is a reconfiguration of molecules that we know as exhaust gases. So in essence, it's the breaking of these gasoline molecule bonds that we know as the explosion of combustion. And as we saw instantly after this took place, these atoms then rebonded and created new molecules as exhaust gas molecules. So the difference being that the carbon atoms bond with two atoms of oxygen. So showing it in its chemical formula, we've got the C for the carbon, and we've got two oxygen atoms. And this is, of course, CO2, carbon dioxide. And it's the first bit here in dioxide, the di, that's just another word for two, basically meaning two oxygen atoms. And the other molecule that's been constructed consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. So the chemical formula for this is two hydrogen atoms, and one oxygen atom, that's H2O, which is of course water. So it's carbon dioxide and water that's the product of combustion, and on the exhaust stroke these gases are emitted out through the exhaust. Of course the water produced as a result of all of this doesn't come flooding out of the exhaust as a liquid, it comes out with the exhaust gases more like a steam. So what I've just explained is complete combustion. That's when everything's going well, when there's enough oxygen and the chemical processes that are occurring are favouring a great combustion.
And so let's have a look how that differs from incomplete combustion, where there's a state of not enough oxygen available. So in this instance, where there is a certain amount of oxygen, of course, up here in the air that was drawn in in the induction stroke, and this now being compressed and creating heat, the important thing to consider is that this concentrated blanket of gasoline is lying there on top of the piston as a layer of liquid. And because liquid is virtually incompressible, there won't be as much heat generated within this liquid as there is above here in the air. So the fluid will be cooler. And that means even though there's the heat of compression and the spark, which would usually take the heat to a point where the gasoline is reactive, because in this instance the gasoline doesn't hold as much heat, there isn't enough heat to push over that threshold to make all of that gasoline combust. And I'm talking about incomplete combustion here, not no combustion. So there is going to be some of this fuel combusted, but just not all of it the way we've seen previously. So there's going to be different chemical reactions going on inside the cylinder and there's going to be different exhaust gases produced as a result of less oxygen giving air around the gasoline. I'm not saying no oxygen because there wouldn't be any combustion at all. I'm saying less oxygen. So in this instance, following combustion, first of all, there's going to be some gasoline molecules still intact in here. And that's because, as we've already seen, the heat didn't get high enough inside the cylinder to affect a lot of those gasoline molecules and break the bonds between the atoms that make them. And so, in essence, there's still unburnt gasoline inside the cylinder with the exhaust gases. And of course, if there's uncombusted gasoline left inside here, combustion itself wouldn't have been as large and effective as it should have been. And we know this is going to have an effect on the power and efficiency of the engine. As well as still having these unused gasoline molecules in there, some of them, of course, that would have had better exposure to the heat would have been combusted, as we established, so there'll be some carbon dioxide as a result of that. Because there's a lack of oxygen, we'll tend to find that some carbon atoms are only bound to one oxygen. And the chemical formula for this is just what it's shown as, CO. So like always, we've got the C here, representing the carbon, and then, this time, instead of dioxide, it's monoxide. Mon, from the word mono, which means one, so one oxygen. At the same time, as a result of incomplete combustion, carbon atoms can exist inside here without anything bound to them, so they're hanging around there on their own. Again, simply because there's not enough oxygen atoms to bound to them. And it's these free carbon atoms that can be seen in the exhaust smoke as black soot. The hydrogen atoms will always bind to the oxygen to make water molecules. And we can see now the products of incomplete combustion. We've got the deadly carbon monoxide. There's still water produced, but now there's free carbons as soot. But it's important to note that your average internal combustion engine doesn't combust fuel absolutely completely and perfectly. But the more perfectly it does so, of course, the better. So we can see that it's essential for efficient running of the engine to produce a situation where there is as complete combustion as we can possibly get. And it's the job of the carburetor to make sure that there's enough oxygen available for the gasoline to allow a combustion that's as complete as possible. And it does that by adding in oxygen-rich air into the fuel in specific amounts OK, so in order to explain how the carburetor transforms this liquid gasoline fuel into a form that's combustible by the engine, I will have to explain how the carburetor's induction tube works. Air is drawn into the induction tube on its way into the engine. When the air goes through the restriction here, its velocity increases. Basically, it speeds up. There's a decrease of pressure here. But from here, because the engine has to pull such a large volume of air through this restriction in order to feed it with all the air that it needs, it has to build up quite a strong suction pressure, this side of the restriction. And it's this that helps to pull out fuel out of the main jet. And because there's low pressure here, it's easily drawn out and into the inlet tube. But the fuel entering the inlet tube doesn't come out as a liquid as we know it, because this form can't be combusted by the engine. So instead, it comes out partially separated by air. 
So the fuel goes through what's called an emulsification process within the main jet even before it comes out into the induction tube. As the suction pressure caused by the engine draws through the air filter and into the induction tube, it also sends it down a separate channel way connected to the main jet. And so as the air floods in, the cover allows it to flow down the outside of the main jet and in through the holes. The air that enters through these holes is at a pressure that allows it to force its way into that liquid fuel, thus mixing with it. And it's this mix of air and fuel here that's referred to as the fuel being emulsified. And it's this area of the main jet that's known as the emulsification tube. The emulsified fuel is drawn out of the main jet into the inlet of the carburetor and as the air in the centre of the restriction is travelling at high velocity, this high velocity air hits the emulsified fuel so hard this is what's known as atomizing it. Now the fuel is separated enough with enough air between it looking more like a mist at this point than a fluid that when it enters the engine it can combust efficiently. So in essence it's oxygen plus gasoline fuel plus a spark which creates combustion all in the presence of a significant amount of compression in the internal combustion engine. And so this is why the spark plug couldn't ignite the gasoline in this situation. Which leads on to the reason why the engine can't combust the gasoline in this form. And so at that I want to thank you so much for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here are some more of my videos that might help you along the way. Please like and subscribe and I'll be back soon. Thank you for watching. <laughs>